The goal of Pokémon, when you play it normally, without a weird and pointless challenge video, is to catch them all. And that's not my opinion. It's literally the motto. Gotta catch em all. But what if I wanted to rebel and not imprison Pokémon? What if, instead, I am a Pokémon rights activist? Now, just hear me out before you run away screaming. For this challenge, I will attempt to beat a mostly hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokémon Yellow without ever throwing a Pokéball. Let's see if I can do it. For this run, my name kind of has to be PETA. It just makes sense. My innocence and SNES playing childhood is ruined when I try to play in the grass like a normal 10 year old kid and Professor Oak rips this poor, innocent little Pikachu away from his family right in front of me. After seeing the terror in Pikachu's eyes, I make a vow to never catch a Pokemon myself. Which, as you might imagine, makes me a very popular kid in this world that revolves around legal dogfights. Of course, that doesn't stop me from taking Pizza Rat away from Professor Oak, he doesn't deserve a Pokemon, and having it battle not PETA's Eevee. Even after a paralysis, Pizza Rat is still too traumatized by his abrupt imprisonment that he can't Thundershock correctly, and he ends up falling to Eevee. After losing here, I realize the only way to achieve my lifelong dream that I made up one minute ago and liberate every Pokemon is to destroy the system from the inside. Meaning, I will need to train my Pokemon to be the very best by having them battle. But catching new Pokemon is a line I will not cross. Of course, Pizza Rat doesn't particularly like me at the moment, even though I'm not the one who caught him. Get over it already, man. Sheesh. Oak tries one last time to entice me to break my code of ethics by giving me a Pokedex that autofills as I catch Pokemon. As cool as that may be, it doesn't make locking up Pokemon okay. I need to take the high road here. Unfortunately, said road will have a number of hurdles. The biggest just so happens to be at the start, with Brock and his ground Pokemon. And since I am refusing to catch any Pokemon, Pizza Rat is the only one I can have on my team. Meaning, I need to EV train very precisely for that fight. Pizza Rat runs away from Pidgeys and defeats mostly Nidorans for the attack and defense boost and Mankeys for the attack gain, with the occasional Spearow thrown in for good measure. In Gen 1, EVs are a bit different and you're not limited to maximizing only two stats in the way you are in future generations. Of course, I am still limited by my level. After a bit of EV training, Pizza Rat reaches level 10 and is ready to face down Not Pita once again. He is a Spearow killing expert at this point and has been EV training, so the EV goes down evilly. We decide to head towards Pewter City and the first gym, but we're stopped by this old dude who is in on the whole catch Pokemon trend. To make matters worse, he totally sucks and can't even catch a Rattata. If you're gonna be all evil, at least do it well. Pizza Rat throws down on a couple of bug catchers in Viridian Forest, no more catching on our watch, and arrives in Pewter City. But since my rat is still under the level cap, we go back through the forest to get back to our favorite grass patch. Now you might think using my Pizza Rat to battle these Pokemon is inhumane and not up to PETA code. But sometimes the ends, i.e. stopping the legal capture of wild creatures, justifies the means of making them fight to the death. We can't change all at once. Countless super speedy minutes later, Pizza Rat gets to level 15 and learns Double Team. Wait a second, I can hear you say from your computer and or phone screen that the government is certainly monitoring at all times. How can this be a hardcore Nuzlocke if Pizza Rat is over Brock's level cap? To which I respond, I said from the beginning this was a mostly hardcore Nuzlocke. It is literally impossible for a single Pikachu to beat Brock without Double Team, even with the massive amount of EV training I did which, I might add, raised my attack two whole points higher than it otherwise would have been, and my defense a single point. So yeah, that was totally worth the time it took. But at least Pizza Rat is starting to like me now, and it's 100% not Stockholm Syndrome, only 95%. The Geodude fight goes about as well as you would expect. Pizza Rat spams double team, gets hit a number of times, but eventually gets to plus six evasion. Several tail whips later, Geodude's defenses are so low, he falls to three quick attacks, never connecting with another tackle. Good thing this dude doesn't have a defense curl like in red and blue. Onyx manages to hit once with a crit and gets his defenses lowered a ton. But then we see one of the weird Gen 1 issues. In Gen 1, critical hits ignore all stat changes, including the good ones like Onyx's lowered defenses. 
so these two crit quick attacks do significantly less than a non-crit does next turn. Crits are one of the big reasons I haven't actually Nuzlocke Gen 1 yet, but more on that later. Either way, a few non-crit quick attacks later, and in spite of being binded, Pizza Rat manages to win against two rock ground Pokemon. And from here on out, I will abide by the level caps, so now it's a true hardcore Nuzlocke. Even after getting hit by some massive rocks, Pizza Rat is overjoyed by our victory, since we are one step closer to burning the entire Pokemon League structure to the ground. To do that, we need some help in the form of a magic carp from some weird fisherman. But hey, I didn't catch this fish, so he's fair game to use. After beating up some archaeologist just trying to do his job, I steal one of his dead Pokemon fossils, which is also fair game. I pick the Helix fossil because I normally go for the Dome fossil, but I quickly regret that decision. Just like you'll regret getting this far, but not subscribing to the channel. So go ahead and do it, leave a like and a comment as well. Everything helps the algorithm and I really appreciate it. At this point, I completely forgot about Team Rocket here because I'm used to playing Gen 3 Kanto. And Pizza Rat is only at half health. But thanks to a few double teams, I get lucky and Pizza Rat finishes off the Ekans, Meowth, and Coughing all on his own, because Shamu is still just a weak fish. That was close. Looks like I need another teammate who can carry his own weight. In Cerulean, I find just the thing in a Bulbasaur. Now, this encounter gets awfully close to crossing the line, since here he is all free and happy. But once I take him, he gets put into a Pokeball. But I never actually threw one, so it's okay. I do throw him into the box, so I can match Misty's team size. Pizza Rat makes short work of Staryu with just a few Thundershocks, and Shamu bites the Starmie to death. It may not be super effective in this gen, since bite is a normal move, but at least it's based on attack. That was much easier than the previous gym, and after a slow start, things should begin to pick up. As I'm reveling in my victory, I run into Not Pita, who brags about all of the little creatures he has imprisoned, both smart and strong ones. That's not a thing to brag about, you little monster. His neither strong nor smart Spearow is defeated in a few Thundershocks. And for Sandshrew, I use Dolly for the first time here to get a single Vine Whip crit. We're going to be seeing a lot of crits from this guy pretty soon. Rattata goes down in a few hits as well, and so does the Eevee. I interrogate Not Pita, again, the end justify the means, until he spills the beans on Bill his friend who has captured a crap ton of rare Pokemon that I will need to liberate. He's also the guy who made the PC to digitally trap more than six Pokemon at a time. Man, this entire world revolves around mistreating the wildlife. North of Cerulean, this kid recognizes the error of his evil Pokemon trainer ways and offers to release an innocent little Charmander into the wild. That sounds good to me. But then I realize I can use this Charmander to save countless other Pokemon. And again, I'm not the one who caught him, so I'll just take him off your hands. I promise that I'll release you at some point in the future. Upon entering the Pokemaniac's house, that nickname is the epitome of a bad guy, Pizza Rat and I discover that this ugly thing is a Pokemon-human hybrid. Not only does Bill have a large collection of Pokemon, he also performs unnecessary and dangerous experiments on them. He's even worse than I thought. Against my better judgment, I decide to help him unfuse from said Pokemon because it at least was innocent. And yet, after the cell separator, only Bill comes out. Uh -huh. No Pokemon or anything. Pizza Rat and I are astounded. I talk to Bill, intending to give him a piece of my mind, how dare you treat Pokemon like that, but he dangles a cruise ticket in front of my face that makes me forget everything else. I'm not proud of it, okay, but I've never been on a cruise before, and this might be my only chance. Believe it or not, being a Pokemon activist doesn't pay very well. Maybe I'll return sometime later to finish what I started here. After checking one last time for any small hiding Pokemon, we're still confused and decide to just head on out. Unfortunately, this cruise is not nearly as relaxing as I had hoped. It's full of trainers who want to battle for whatever reason, including not PETA. This monster has caught 40 Pokemon now, yet he still only has a team of four. Pizza Rat one-shots the Spearow, and on Rattata, we see another Gen 1 feature where healing items are used after my Pokemon attack, in lieu of the trainer's attack. It's a bit weird, to be honest. Dolly once again defeats the Sandshrew, and I show off Laika the Charmeleon, whose Gen 1 back sprite looks like a hippo with a spike. Ugly or not, he gets the job done. 
We watched this disappointing boat leave Vermilion City forever, so now I'm never gonna get a Mew from under that infamous truck. Surge forces me to dig through the trash before we can fight. This is so degrading and humiliating. But this is the guy who believes a Pokemon battle is war and engages in it multiple times a day. He's pretty messed up. This is a 1v1 with Dolly the Ivasaur facing off against his Raichu. Because Vine Whip is relatively weak, Dolly uses Leech Seed and then Poison Powder too. If Raichu had just kept using Thunderbolt, I might have lost. But he seemed to be obsessed with Growl for whatever reason, so that let me win. After getting the badge, a police officer asks me to rehabilitate a so-called troublesome Squirtle. We make our way to Celadon, passing through a few guards who extort me for some water. Before facing Erika, I need to decide what to do for my Celadon encounter. I could cheat to get a bunch of coins and buy myself one of these vending machine Pokemon, but I don't really want to do that, and Eevee is better than most of them anyway. In the Pokemart, I buy a few vital items, like the Pokedoll and a Thunderstone. Do you know what I'm going to do with the Pokedoll? If you do, let me know in the comments. With the Thunderstone, Pizza Rat refuses to become stronger and evolve. And you know what? That's okay. I will respect his autonomy. Instead, I just evolve Balto, who will become my go-to electric Pokemon from now on. Not that any of that matters for the Erika battle. The strongest move Laika has access to right now is Ember. So Tangela survives a few hits, but does basically nothing. Weeping Bell, on the other hand, does enough that I need to swap. Another little glitch with Gen 1 is sometimes the super effective or not very effective text is wrong. For some Pokemon with dual types, like when Dolly is hit with a poison type move, it does neutral damage, but the text says that he resists it. Dolly uses a ton of cuts and after a crit needs to swap to Shamu. We haven't really used him in a while. One Dragon Rage finishes off the Vileplume. With that fourth badge, we are halfway through our goal of taking over the Pokemon League but for good reasons. That just sounded like a bad guy monologue for a second there. After this gym, you typically go to the Rocket Underground to stop Giovanni and get the Sylph Scope, but I don't want to do that. Instead, I decide to pay homage to the poor Pokemon who were forced to fight to the death, and I do so by fighting not PETA to the death. Pizza Rat Thunderbolts his Fero, and Vulpix as well. Magnemite takes a few hits, and then Straw Turt shows up to Water Gun Sandshrew. Last, his Eevee is bit a couple of times. Even without the Sylph scope to identify ghosts, I can still somehow see the ghost Pokemon that these Channeler trainers send out. So that's kind of weird. But the Marowak leading to the top floor cannot be identified. Normally, you need the scope for this because when you run away, he appears again, and you can't fight him. However, one trick I learned as a kid is that you can throw a Poke Doll at this thing, and that's it. You have calmed a restless soul with a Clefairy Doll. So in Gen 1, you can, in fact, skip the entire rocket hideout in Celadon City, as long as you don't mind not catching a Ghastly. Did you know about that little trick? I think it's pretty cool. After expertly throwing around a toy, it's time to do the same with Team Rocket. Laika makes short work of them with his guaranteed crit slash attack. Because crit is based on speed in Gen 1, and slash increases the crit probability dramatically, most Pokemon with slash are all but guaranteed to get a crit in Gen 1. Jumping ahead to Saffron City, most of the town is overrun by rockets, and the police are too busy not breaking up Pokemon battles to come and help. However, this fighting dojo is open, so let's go there. Laika once again makes short work of these guys, now using Fly. But another Gen 1 trivia, did you know that in the original Red and Blue, Charizard could not learn Fly? Yeah, the Fire Flying starter had no access to flying moves at all. Didn't make much sense to me either. But Yellow fixed that mistake, and he quickly defeats Dojo Man. In lieu of taking his emblem, which I guess is a karate thing or something, he offers up one of his own fighting Pokemon. After the physical special split in Gen 4, Hitmonchan actually becomes a decently useful Pokemon, and I would have chosen him. But without access to useful elemental moves, Hitmonlee is certainly the better option. Unfortunately, I can't skip Sylph Company and not PETA has been waiting for me in this rocket overrun building, not doing anything to help whatsoever. This just goes to show you, you can't trust non-Pokemon activists to do the right thing. They are all complicit in the system. Silence is violence, patriarchy, colonialism, and all those other buzzwords too. Now that Dolly has fully evolved, she can use her guaranteed to crit move, Razor Leaf. For whatever reason, the best water move Straw Turt the Blastoise has 
is still just Water Gun, which is sad, but after a few pathetic squirts, Ninetales is defeated. Kadabra is slash crit, but Vaporeon survives the crit razor leaf, I guess I forgot how much HP he has, and almost takes out Dolly with an Aurora Beam. That was close. Following my victory, this dude gives me a Lapras, who is a Nuzlocke champion in basically any game. And while this beautiful beast could destroy Giovanni, who I am now meeting for the first time, so what are you talking about, dude? I instead want to bring out the kicks for Harambe, the Hitmonlee. He starts with a few Meditates, and then body slams Nidorino, who is just spamming Focus Energy. Persian gets a crit bite, because that stupid cat is fast. Rhyhorn falls to a double kick, and then it's on to Nidoqueen. Admittedly, at this HP, leaving Harambe in is a bit of a risk, but I don't want to waste the two Meditates that he got. Body Slam fails to one-shot, paralyzes Nidoqueen, who still hits through it, getting a crit, and finishing off Harambe. Dang it! If either of those moves hadn't crit, he would still be alive. But no, he had to get crit sniped for no real reason, other than to artificially provide drama for this video. What a messed up world we live in. Straw Turret is able to come out, and by now he has Bubble Beam to finish off this queen. Yes, I know I could have gotten him Surf, but I didn't want to go to Fuchsia just yet, so hold your horses. But not really, because animal abuse. I saved this millionaire's business, because the game made me, and his response is to give me a super secret Master Ball that will never fail to catch a Pokemon. What about my journey so far makes him think I would want this thing? Has he even watched the video? So right in front of this president, I rummage through my bag, find the Master Ball, and throw it directly into the trash, holding eye contact the entire time. What a horrible person you are, Mr. Sylph, if that even is your real name. At least now Team Rocket has left, so I can enter the fifth gym. I decide to leave with Balto, the Jolteon. Not for his electric attacks, but because he learns Pin Missile, which is super effective against Sabrina's psychic Pokemon. Abra immediately falls, Kadabra takes the first few hits, only to recover, and then falls to the second volley. Last is Alakazam. After a Thunder Wave, Balto gets a 5 hit Pin Missile, almost beating the gym, having taken no damage at all. He does end up getting Crit Psychic, but it's too little, too late for Sabrina. Couldn't see that one coming, could she? Now I get to Fuchsia, and I am horrified by this city. Not only do they keep mighty, majestic Pokemon, like Slowpoke and Voltorb, in cages for people to gawk at, but there is also something called the Safari Game, Pokemon You Catch, which is made all the worse due to that crappy slogan. For the small price of $500, you get to enter the Safari Zone and traumatize as many Pokemon as you want. I'm loath to support anything about this endeavor, but I heard there's a prize inside, and I like free things. So to make up for participating in this evil, every time I see a Pokemon, I throw it some food. I bet you're the type of people who throw rocks instead, you monsters. The Pokemon gods must be looking over my shoulder, because after doing this good deed a few times, I see the most majestic Safari Zone Pokemon, Chansey, who I give a ton of bait, because she deserves it. I then get the secret prize, and head over to Koga's gym, where the invisible walls are not so invisible. I guess Koga is not such a great ninja. I decide to use Tilikum, the Lapras, for her first major battle. She can learn Psychic, and one-shots Koga's Venonats, all three of them. He needs a better team. Venomoth goes first, and does Toxic Tilikum, but that was not nearly enough to quench her anger after seeing her kin locked up in this city. Now that my Pokemon can Surf, I do a bit of cheating to give Pizza Rat Surf. That way, I can talk to this surfer dude and play the yellow exclusive Surfing Pikachu minigame. I may not be very good, but I do get 550 points of radness. We do some normal surfing to get to Cinnabar, where I am able to revive both an Ammonite and an Aerodactyl. And these are the last two Pokemon I'm going to get. Before facing Blaine, I explore the burned down building, and from diary fragments of some random scientist, which some people suspect was actually Mr. Fuji, I learned that here they performed some messed up experiments with Pokemon. If this building hadn't already been mostly destroyed, I would have done it myself. As it is, I just need a key so I can answer this question correctly and still get docked. What do you mean Caterpie evolves into Butterfree? He evolves into Metapod. What kind of trick question is this? I decide to lead against Blaine with Seabiscuit the Aerodactyl. The only problem is, 
Gen 1 Aerodactyl has access to literally zero rock moves. He can't even get Earthquake. Not that it's rock, but I'm still frustrated. So I try to use the Hyper Beam glitch, but fail to one-shot Ninetales, and he hits himself several times in confusion. This leaves everything up to Jaws, the Amistar, who make short work of Blaine's Pokémon with one Surf each. There's really nothing else to do now, but jump straight to Giovanni. I can't avoid him this time either. Still, skipping one of those fights was nice. Shamu actually has pretty good special in Gen 1, so Surf easily takes out Doug Trio. I swap to Dolly on a Persian and Razor Leaf just a few times. I pivot to Tilikum, not expecting Nidoqueen to try and thunder a Venusaur, but apparently I overestimated Giovanni's intelligence. She survives the crit, and I decide to bring Dolly back out to use Leech Seed. A few hits later, and the Queen is gone. I don't bother seeding the King, it's not necessary because of the guaranteed Razor Leaf crits. Giovanni's last Pokémon is a Rhydon, which is a Pokémon that he does not have in the Gen 3 remakes for whatever reason. With 8 badges, becoming the Kanto Champion is now well within my reach. And once I'm at the top, I can force people to free their Pokémon. After all, I'll be the strongest trainer in the world. But we still have one more obstacle before getting to the Elite Four. Not PETA on the same route I destroyed him with my EV Train Pizza Rat all those minutes ago. Time to do it again, but let's pick up the pace. Sand Slash is Razor Leaved. Execute is Pin Missiled by Balto. Magneton is also Razor Leaved. Ninetales is Slashed a few times by Laika. And Kadabra is Fire Spin Slashed, just in case. His last Pokemon is Vaporeon, so I pivot to Balto on a Haze, but fail to one-shot with Thunderbolt. And, wouldn't you know it, Hydro Pump hits and crits, destroying Balto. Dang it, that's not fair. I was so close to the end, too. Well, I guess Pizza Rat is back to being my go-to electric Pokemon. I'm not sure why not PETA's Pokemon keep coming back to life after I defeat them, because mine never do. It's weird. Either way, it's time to get rid of Balto, and I need to do the annoying Gen 1 box change. Goodbye, dead Balto. You didn't do a ton, but I still loved you. And I did want to use you in the Lorelei fight, guess not. Jumping right to the Leap 4, because nothing else happened in Victory Road, here is the team I have decided to use. These icons can be difficult to tell apart, so hopefully I don't forget who is who. I need to use my Pokémon for violence just a few more times, and then they can rest. Pizza Rat, Thunderbolt's Dugong, as well as Cloyster. I was concerned about Slowbro getting a crit here, but he chooses to hide in his tail shell and is also Thunderbolted. Laika comes out on an Ice Punch that does a crap ton of damage, so Straw Turret immediately comes out to be double slapped and then thrashed by Jinx, which are not the best moves for a special attacker. After a single strength, he is paralyzed by Lapras, so let's bring out my own Tilikum, who has Thunder. I would have given him Thunderbolt, but I had to use that TM on Balto because he never learns it naturally. It connects, and after a few Psychics, we have defeated Lorelei. I was pretty nervous about that fight without Balto, but it went alright. Bruno is obviously going to be easy. He always is. Dolly Razor Leafs the Onyx, Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, and the second Onyx. Machamp does survive the first hit, but wastes his turn with Leer that doesn't even connect. So yeah, no problems there. Agatha is a bit concerning, but Laika can learn Earthquake, and Gengars do not float yet. Golbat does, but after a slash, Agatha swaps to Haunter for whatever reason. He is Earthquaked, and the Bat slashed again. Arbok survives the Earthquake, does some damage with Rap, but falls to Flamethrower. The last Gengar survives the hit, uses a Super Potion, and then never attacks. That wasn't so bad. I considered giving Laika Swords Dance here, but it looks like I didn't need it. Trusty Pizza Rat leads the charge against Lance to, you guessed it, Thunderbolt his Gyarados. Before swapping, he uses Light Screen and is Hyper Beamed in the face by Dragonair. Good thing it wasn't a Dragonite, or he would have been a goner. Tilikum comes out on the recharge turn to use Ice Beam. The second Dragonair follows suit. Aerodactyl manages a fly before being defeated. Last, Dragonite tries to Flamethrower, but it's not nearly enough, and Ice Beam finishes off the battle, making me the Pokémon Master. Except for one little problem, not PETA got here first. And like always, he's trying to prevent my noble work, because we've learned throughout this video how much he loves to catch Pokémon, and I am a threat to his horrible hobby. Alright, just one last battle. 
and all these Pokemon will be free. As always, Dolly Razor Leafs the Sand Slash. Shamu makes his Elite Four debut because I didn't want to just sweep with Gyarados through the entire Elite Four, even though I totally could have. He uses the Hyper Beam Glitch. You see, in Gen 1, if Hyper Beam takes out your opponent's Pokemon, then you don't have to use a Recharge turn. So Shamu can then use Blizzard on Executor, but it misses. The next one hits, but he is losing health to Leech Seed. So it's time to use another Hyper Beam Glitch. He fails to hit Ninetales with Surf, thanks to Alakazam's Kinesis, but it does connect on the next turn. Unfortunately, Shamu meets his match with Magneton. Dolly returns on a Screech and uses the only move she really needs in Gen 1. I go for Leech Seed on the Vaporeon for no real reason, and Dolly is crit Aurora Beamed, almost to death. I can't lose a Pokemon in this last fight, not when they're so close to their freedom, so I pivot back to Shamu to deal just a bit of damage. I don't want him to defeat Vaporeon though. That honor belongs to my best friend, Pizza Rat. Even though Thunderbolt fails to get the kill, Vaporeon just uses Haze instead of trying to defeat Pizza Rat once and for all. And so, one more turn of Thunderbolt and my good friend has finally succeeded in helping me to become the Pokemon Champion of the World. At least at this point, Oak realizes that you need to treat your Pokemon with love and respect. They need to be like friends. But how often do you send your friends to fight other people's friends for money? Hopefully, only once or twice a year, like normal. So why should Pokemon be forced to do it every single day? Before finishing the run, I let my wonderful Pokemon bask in their victory for a short time. But then, it's time to make good on my promise. With my newfound power as the Pokemon Champion, I demand that everyone release all of their Pokemon. And I lead by example, releasing all of my Pokemon. Champions or no, they don't deserve to be held hostage simply because of their strength. Goodbye, my friends. Except for Pizza Rat. He doesn't want to go back into the wild. He would rather stay with me, apparently. And part of being a Pokemon activist is accepting the Pokemon's will. They have their own desires and wishes. So, I suppose that Pizza Rat is here to stay. And that's it. That's the happy ending you were hoping for. Or is it? You see, at this point, Oak finally decides to tell me that there are countless other regions where Pokemon are similarly forced to battle one another. This doesn't just happen in Kanto. It's a global phenomenon. So perhaps PETA and Pizza Rat's journey towards Pokemon abolition has only just begun. Time will tell. And now the video is over. I hope you enjoyed my first ever Nuzlocke of a Gen 1 game. They can be unpredictable but there is still quite a bit of nostalgia for me in Gen 1, so it's fun to go back and replay it on occasion. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next region.